So like I've just mentioned a short time ago, if you're a voting member of this church family, then very soon you'll be invited to nominate up to two people who you believe are suitable to serve as elders. Now to help us do that, I'm going to preach not just one sermon, but, but two. Okay, special treat. Now, why, why would I do that? Well, because our choices need to be firmly shaped by God's word. And thankfully, well, thankfully he tells us quite clearly what we are to look for. So firstly, this morning, we're going to be thinking about the qualifications for elders based on the verses that Lise has just read for us from 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then next Sunday, next Sunday when we meet again, we'll be looking at the work of elders based mostly on, on chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. So today we're, we're focusing on the qualifications. And we're, well, hopefully we've realized already, we're, we're not talking here about it having achieved particular educational standards. And we're not, we're not thinking about having completed a certain, certain course and have a certificate for it or nothing like that. That's not the kind of qualifications we're referring to. No, the qualifications that we're to look for are all qualities of Christian maturity. They're all aspects of a person's godly character which, which mark them out as being suitable to serve as an elder. So let's get, let's get started. Beginning with a description of, of church leadership which we find most often in the Bible. Again and again, Scripture describes people as sheep. Okay, don't know how you feel about being labeled as a sheep. It's not very flattering, but hopefully we realize that it's accurate. The world is full of people with messy lives, ourselves included. All of us are prone to wander into sin. Remember how Isaiah 53 verse 6 begins, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That's a good description of me, and I'm sure you would agree it's a good description of you as well. And that's why we need shepherds. We need those who know how to care for and how to lead messy sheep like us. Now, the good news, the great news is that the Scripture declares that the Lord is our shepherd. We've just been singing that from Psalm 23, and there's numerous other passages, passages that, that describe him in that way too. So the Lord is our shepherd. And in the New Testament, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. The good shepherd who, who even lays down his life for the sheep. All good leadership in the Christian church is based on this model. It's rooted in this whole idea of, of the shepherd and the sheep. So the shepherd we all need is ultimately Jesus himself. But he's also given us under shepherds to tend his flock. Under shepherds, which the New Testament calls, calls uh, elders or overseers. In fact, it also calls them presbyters. And that's why we're called the Presbyterian Church, because we have elders in this position. And just like the, the head shepherd, Jesus, these elders watch over the flock entrusted, entrusted to their care by leading and feeding and protecting the sheep. So how do we identify these under shepherds, these under shepherds that we call elders? Well, one of the most helpful lists of what to look for is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to look, we're going to work through that list just now. And as we do, the thing that I need to stress right at the beginning is that no one fulfills this list perfectly. But we are, looking for, we are looking for people whose lives are clearly growing in the areas that Paul lists. So here we go. Verse 1 reads, If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble task. Those you nominate should want to be elders. In fact, they'll be doing the work of an elder already, but without the name. You'll be able to identify them because they see the crucial importance of an elder's work and their heart's desire is to serve the church by doing that work 
And as I've said, they'll, they'll be doing it already. You'll see them doing it. And then we, we just simply want to recognize that. Yes, someone, it's possible someone might want to be an elder because they're hungry for power. Please don't nominate people like that. More likely, though, is the scenario in which suitably gifted people think that wanting to be an elder is an ungodly thing, that it somehow demonstrates pride and a lack of humility. But that's actually wrong thinking. No, instead, wanting to be an elder is a good ambition. That's what the Bible tells us. Wanting to be an elder is a good ambition if it flows from pure motives rather than from pride or or from anything else. Leadership in the church, I'm sure you'll understand, is, is hard work. It's meant to be. But it's a noble task, says Paul. And why is it a noble task? Well, partly because it involves modeling to others what living for Jesus looks like. And what could be more noble than that? And partly because of how necessary Christian leadership is. It's vital in the, in the church. The sheep need shepherds. And therefore caring for sheep is a good thing. So as you choose who to nominate, look for those who show consistent commitment to Jesus. And who willingly model that commitment to others. Perhaps they're, perhaps they're even helping to, to shepherd others already in some way. So that's verse 1. Verse 2 then. Next we're told that, that we're told at the beginning of verse 2, therefore an overseer, or we call them elders, therefore an overseer must be above reproach. So the noble task of being an elder must be met. And, well, that noble task of being an elder, it demands a noble character to match it. So nominate those who display integrity and Christ-likeness. Above reproach, that's the second qualification every elder must profess and possess. But in a way that, in a way that qualification actually encompasses and, and incorporates all of the other qualities which follow it. So in short, those you nominate should be blameless in their conduct. Now that doesn't mean perfect, but rather someone whose attitude and behavior are consistently of a high standard and who earns the respect and indeed even the admiration of others. Another phrase that Paul sometimes uses is living a life worthy of the calling of God. Living a life worthy of the calling of God, that that should describe the people that you nominate. That's very important because an elder, as we've said already, must be an example in every area of life. Next then, verse 2 continues by requiring that that an elder must be the husband of one wife. Now the Greek text literally literally translates as as a man of one woman. Now, that certainly, that certainly rules out bigamy, or we sometimes call it polygamy. It rules that out. But more than that, it points to, it points to faithfulness in marriage and to, and to sexual purity. And that's so appropriate because this is one area in which leaders are so often vulnerable to fail. And when they fail, the damage and the pain caused can be, can be devastating, not just to the families involved and to the marriages affected, but also to the whole church and to the gospel. It's worth saying that this husband of one wife qualification does not rule out someone who is unmarried. After all, Paul himself was single. And realistically, we, we are unlikely to know about someone's struggles with with lust or pornography that's that's stuff that happens in private we're not likely to know about it but self-control in more public aspects of someone's life is a likely it's a it's a likely uh, to be a good indication if you see self-control in other areas it's likely that that person is 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 self-controlled in every area of life too 
And so too, a good indication is, is a willingness to be accountable to others. Verse 2 continues by telling us that, that an elder must be sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable. Now, the world around us doesn't promote sober-mindedness or, or self-control. And it certainly, certainly doesn't encourage us to be respectable. Quite the opposite. All Christians, all Christians are called to those things. But elders must lead the way by their example. Sober-mindedness means not being overly influenced by passion, lust, or emotion. I'll say that again. Sober-mindedness means not being overly influenced by passion, lust, or emotion. In other words, elders are to be sober in their desires and attitudes and, and appetites and their decisions. And as for self-controlled and respectable, elders must, must keep their thoughts and emotions in check and moderate their actions. So nominate those who are not impulsive, but who are known for their sound judgment and for their godly, ordered lives. Still then, in verse 2, we, are, we see that an elder must be hospitable. Now that seems like a a small thing, but, but actually it's so, so important. God calls Christian people to love one another. We heard that this morning even in our, in our call to worship. God calls us to love one another, even our enemies. And surely hospitality is a, is a concrete expression of that love. And elders should model this. Also, hospitality brings us into, into meaningful relationships, allowing us to reflect Christ's love to others, especially those who are new to the congregation and, and even with those who are beyond the church. And linked to that then, hospitality enables evangelism with unbelievers and it, it, enables, it enables fellowship and discipleship with believers. To nominate those who are hospitable, and not just to a few close friends, but to all. Choose those who, who greet and who speak with everyone. Next then, at the end of verse 2, an elder must be able to teach. Throughout Scripture, and especially in the New Testament, teaching God's Word to others is a hugely significant activity. Just think of its role in, in calling unbelievers to faith and, and think of its role in, in feeding and, and strengthening faith among, among believers. So it's not surprising that the ability to teach is a qualification for elders. Now, not everyone must be able to teach. That's not a requirement for every believer. But elders must because teaching the truth and correcting error is one of the primary tasks of elders. It refers to a, a good knowledge of, of the scriptures and, and an ability to communicate and, and apply the truth of scripture to others. Elders must be able to handle the scriptures faithfully and others should be helped when they do that. Now, that might mean the ability to prepare and preach sermons, but equally, it may mean being able to lead a Bible study or even routinely, routinely encouraging others one-to-one -one using God's Word. And if, a, if the person you're considering has a family, you'll know that they've been teaching their, their kids. An elder must be able to teach. So make sure that you nominate that the people that you nominate, make sure that they display some evidence of ability in this area, even if it's not yet fully developed. But please bear in mind what Paul said back in chapter 2 of this letter. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 12, Paul writes, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. And then in the verses which follow, he explains, the, I guess, the basis of that. He bases it on, on the creation order in Genesis chapter 2. 
That was even before, even before sin entered the world. Women teaching other women in the church and, and women teaching children, that is encouraged elsewhere in the New Testament. But a woman teaching or having authority over men in the church is consistently forbidden, just as it is here. Now, I have to stress that the code, which is the rule book of the Presbyterian Church, it does allow you to nominate women as elders. So you must, you must feel free to do that. The code compels me to remind you of that, which is why, why I read it for us earlier. But before you nominate a woman, for your own conscience sake, you need to, you need to be able to convince yourself that verses like this one on the screen and various other passages too, you need to be able to convince yourself that they don't actually mean what they say. And can I urge you, if you attempt to do that, if you attempt to do that, make sure that God's word is firmly in the driving seat, not the world's ad agendas, not even what you want the outcome to be. Let God speak. And we probably won't all agree on this, this issue. But we're not going to fall out about it, okay? Over the years, I've, I've consistently taught what I've just shared. And each time it comes up in a, in a Bible passage, that's what I've tried to explain. Even recently in our Genesis series, and even last week in, uh, in our Bible study when we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we've, not, we've never fallen out on any of those previous occasions. So hopefully we won't fall out of we won't fall out now either. And if anyone wants to talk this through, I'm more than happy to do so. Before moving on, I need to say that since training and becoming a minister, I've worked with women ministers and I've worked with women elders. And we've always, always worked well together. Women ministers and elders are part of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. The church that I'm part of, the church that we're all part of, so I'll say it again, you can definitely nominate women to become elders. Please don't hear me say otherwise. That is the position of our denomination. But please do get your Bible out and prayerfully think it through for yourself. Hopefully I can't ask more of you than that. It's time though for us to move on. Next then, an elder is to be not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. That's how the list continues in, in verse 3. Drunkenness, violence, and quarreling. They're here together in, in, in Paul's list. And sadly, sadly, they often occur together in life as well. A tendency for any of these things, for, for drunkenness, for violence, or for quarreling, disqualifies a, a person from being an elder. It doesn't mean that you won't ever get angry or, or whatever. It's a, it's a tendency, a, a propensity for those things, which rules a person out. Instead of, being, instead of being violent, an elder must be gentle. Instead of being, and being quarrelsome or argumentative or divisive, an elder must be a peacemaker seeking harmony and unity in the church, but not at the expense of God's truth. And then at the end of verse 3, not a lover of money. Those suitable to serve as elders must not be greedy for wealth or for possessions. So consider a person's attitude towards money before you nominate them. Having money is not a problem, okay? Having money is not a problem. Loving money most certainly is a problem. So look for generosity, because generosity is a, is a sure sign that money has no hold over a person. And in terms, of, in terms of financial giving to the church or to charities, that's, that's most often done in private. So we're unlikely to know if someone is generous with their money. But we can look for those who are generous in other ways. We can look for, for those who are generous with their time and their talents, for example. Because they, those things tend to go together. Someone who's generous in one area of life tends to be generous in all. And look for those who display contentment. 
Those who are content will not be lovers of money. The next qualification for elders actually stretches over two verses. We've gone very slowly through some verses that list numerous things, but this next qualification stretches over verses 4 and 5, which is on the screen. The church is a family. We've, that's a phrase that we're familiar with. That's a concept that we, I think we cherish. The church is a family, a group of brothers and sisters in Christ, together submitting to God the Father with the enabling help of the Holy Spirit. That's how one writer puts it, and I think it's helpful. And just like our, just like our biological families, the church family, the church family needs leadership too. Proven ability to lead and to nurture in, in the home very likely points to an ability to lead and nurture in the church. Now, it's true. Sadly, it's true that the things go wrong in families, and they go wrong for all kinds of different reasons. But if the reason is failure to lead or to nurture, then that parent is not suitable as an elder. That's Paul's point. That's what he's saying in, the, in these two verses. And for those who are unmarried or, or who don't have children, we should look for those, sorry, we should look for other evidence of leadership and of an ability to nurture and care. In verse 6 then, Paul says an elder must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Simply put, elders must not be new believers who still need cared for as infants in the faith. No, instead, they must be spiritually mature. Now, the reason for that comes at the end of verse 6. It's because humility takes time to develop. Electing a, a new elder, sorry, a new believer and making them a, an elder, that risks causing them to become proud. And pride opens the door for all manner of other sins. It's worth saying that this is not a matter of, of age. It's not ageist or ageism, whatever the right term is. Someone who's been, who's been a Christian for decades can still lack spiritual maturity, while someone who's only been following Jesus for five or six years might, in fact, show remarkable progress in their walk of faith. So it's not a matter of age. No, nominate those who display spiritual maturity and humility. Then the final qualifications for elders is in verse 7. It's there on the screen. What unbelievers think of us really matters. It really does matter. Therefore, those who desire to be elders must have a good, repu a good reputation, not only in the church, but also in the world. So, for example, someone who's lazy or dishonest or, or untrustworthy in the world is not suitable as an elder in God's church. Every believer can expect to be rejected by friends and colleagues because of our faith in Jesus. And that's true for elders as well. But they must not have a bad reputation in the world because of, because of some sinful reason. So there you have it. All the qualifications that Paul lists in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, they're there for us on the screen. And you're probably thinking right about now, you're probably thinking, blimey, that's a high standard. Who could ever possibly measure up to those requirements? Who could ever measure up to those things perfectly? Well, the answer, of course, is no one. Because none of us is perfect in all of those ways listed, and I, and I include myself in that. Now, your job, if you're a voting member, is to prayerfully consider who best fits, who best fits the description that we've worked through in this little message this morning. So look for Christian people. Christian people who, in dependence on God, show evidence of progress in each of the ways which are listed there. People whose faith is maturing, maturing in line with these qualifications. If you only come up with one person, or even if you only come up with no people, that's okay. 
But please don't nominate people simply because you have a page in front of you and a pen in your hand. No, please give this, give this your serious, prayerful consideration. Few things matter as much as the church when it's appointing its leaders. Now, perhaps that all sounds very negative. Well, actually, actually, I think that I think you'll find that here in Nice there are people who are suitable to serve as elders. There are people fitted for this role. And so to remind you about what we've thought about today, please take home the little leaflet, read it through, consider it prayerfully. And when you get that list next week, read through the list of names, read through the, the list of qualifications, and prayerfully consider who you, who you believe God might be leading us as a congregation, the people you think God might wish us to appoint as our, our new elders to serve alongside Ron, Linda, and myself. Just now, let's, let's pray together.